Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, I check out a whole bunch of cool 2019 kit already on the market and some of it, some cool new stuff. There's loads of great stuff for you. And also, I've got a new bike, which is pretty cool. So I recently visited the Core Bike Show. Now this is a trade show where dealers get to check out all the new cool stuff that they want to be stocking in their stores. But I managed to sneak along and see some of the cool stuff myself. Now what's coming up on news this week is a whole bunch of things. Some of them very small, some of them really, really cool. So starting off, gonna hit you with the new Hope bike, the HB130. Now get a load of this. Like their other Hope bike that they made at their in-house facility for making carbon fiber, in the UK in Barnoldswick. This has the same manufacturing techniques, it's got the very similar back end on it, but this revolves around 29 inch wheels and it's got 130 millimeters of travel. Now there's a flip chip in there for adjusting geometry and bottom bracket height on there. It is 100% manufactured in Barnoldswick, which is up in Yorkshire there. Now it's got carbon front triangle, it's got an aluminium machined and bonded rear triangle with a post brake mount on there bottle cage mounts and all that cool stuff, but just look at the finish on it. This thing is something special. I think it's a really, really attractive bike from the British manufacturer that's very famous for its hubs and brakes. Now availability, you might ask, is gonna be sometime later this year. They say summer 2019, so we might be seeing some of these little bad boys out on the trails this year. Next up is something tiny that I spotted from the brand Lazine, or Lazine. Now this is a tubeless reaming kit for plugging holes in torn sidewalls or tire carcasses. It's just an especially neat version. There's a lot out there in the market, including the Samurai Swords, which we recently featured, and various other options. But this is just, it's just a nice looking little tool. It comes in a little plastic case, and it's got five of the little rubber worms that comes with it. Just look how nice it is. Lovely little bit of kit, that. Next up comes from X-Fusion. Of course, we fitted some X-Fusion forks onto the bike build project. That of course, went to Evo from Slovakia. Now, X-Fusion finally are doing volume spaces for the suspension forks. They've got a new top cap design, completely revised, and it has a stacking system that thread in, much like those that you see on the RockShox Lyric and the RockShox Pike. So as far as we know, this is a retrofitable item to other models of X-Fusion fork and all future forks. Simple upgrade, but very cool. Okay, next up, I was talking to the guys from MRP about their forks and their shocks. Something that really stood out to me was the new Hazard rear shock. Now this is a coil shock designed for enduro and all mountain riding. It's got adjustable low and high speed compression via a switch on the shock. It's got rebound and preload as you might imagine. But something that really drew me to the shock was the springs that were alongside it. So they've got a super lightweight steel spring, which is quite popular these days. Of course, titanium springs are incredibly expensive by comparison to the steel offerings. Obviously, steel springs are quite a lot heavier, so by having that option now of a lightweight steel spring, you can keep your weight of your bike down, but still benefit from the performance of a coil shock. But as we know, a lot of suspension bikes, in particular all mountain and enduro bikes, are designed around the use of a progressive air shock on there. And if you just simply put a coil shock on there, you're gonna have a bit more of a linear feel, and it's not necessarily gonna work. But MRP, as far as I'm aware, have got one of, if not the first, progressive coil spring for mountain bikes, which I think is gonna be a complete game changer because I know a lot of friends who are starting to go back towards coil shocks for out and out performance. I think that's a really hot product, so watch out for that one. Now, this next product isn't actually anything new. It just looks new. So it's a Renthal Fat Bar Stealth. So it's all black, black on black. Uh, nice stealthy addition to the range, strictly limited edition. There's only 800 pairs of these available. And well, that's it really. It's a really nice handlebar and it's in all black now. So pretty trick looking for all you people out there that like to go for the stealthy look. Now, a while ago on the show, I mentioned the Hayes Dominion brakes, which I've heard nothing but good things about. And I saw what I thought was the Hayes Dominion brakes, but I realized they didn't have any Hayes logos on, so it did confuse me until I looked a bit closer. But this is them. The lever design looks nice, but still the thing that really drew me to them is the caliper design. Now, if you remember, they had a really cool feature built onto them. They had essentially grub screws built into where the caliper sits onto the post mount in order to tune the position of the caliper. Sometimes, even when you have the correct amount of washers above and below that caliper, it could be really hard to set your brake up 100% perfectly without it rubbing. 
Now this is just a bit of a foolproof way of doing it. I think it's a really smart design and it could well be something that we might see on some other brakes out there. I hope so, I think it looks really cool. Now 100%, everyone knows they make really cool goggles and eyewear and of course they make some nice helmets, but I didn't quite realize how much they made. Have a look at this shot. So this firstly is their range of gloves. Bear in mind that each of these gloves comes in a whole number of colors and of course a whole number of sizes from extra small, uh, maybe even extra extra small in some of the models through to double XL in some of those models. I think it's quite insane how much they do. But one in particular that drew my attention was the Cognito glove. Now this is yet on screen. Now notice that it's got a slightly raised knuckle section on it. Now I'm generally not a fan of gloves with armor and I prefer gloves to be as thin as possible. They're literally just there to uh, give me a bit of protection and to aid grip and traction on the bars. Uh, of course, this is my preference. So I particularly like these because it's got minimal padding on the back and it's using D30, which of course, it conforms to your knuckles, but of course, when it's struck by a hard obstacle, it dissipates that force. So I think these are a really cool glove, especially if like me, you like a glove that's very minimal. I can tell you, they're certainly very comfy and they come in a whole bunch of great colors. Now also, they have one of the nicest looking full face helmets on the market. I think the aircraft, this one here, is absolutely stunning, especially in that colorway. Now you'll know that Loic Bruni and various other riders out there have been using this helmet on the World Cup scene. It's a certified downhill race helmet. Lovely bit of kit. Quite pricey though. So in the UK, they're about 350 quid. Uh, of course, you can't put a price on protection. I get that and people do spend a lot of money on helmets. But for those with a bit more, bit more of a budget, you can now get this model. Now this is the polycarbonate model and it looks just the same. If anything, this particular color almost looks a bit nicer. I think Stormtrooper kind of look. Um, and it's 100 quid cheaper. I think that is phenomenal to offer something that looks that good with the equal amount of protection. Okay, it's a little bit heavier, but it looks the same. Super cool. I think that's a really, really nice looking helmet. Um, and I also think there might be something else coming from 100% in terms of helmets soon, but uh, mum's a word on that one. Now also 100% do a really, really cool looking range of minimal and maximum protection knee and elbow pads. In particular, this one, the Surpass, which really stood out to me. So I at first thought this was one of those super minimal pads, much like a sock that you put onto your leg, but actually it's the one with the highest protection for a maneuverable pad that they offer that doesn't have a solid cap on it. It actually passes and exceeds level two, which I think not many other knee pads actually do pass it. It tends to be more of a motocross type thing. Um, super protective, it's got a honeycomb style construction to the armor in there to really dissipate any sort of impact. It wraps around your legs, so you get side protection on there as well, and it's really, really maneuverable. Now they also make an elbow version of this and it's almost like it's got an like articulated joint. So none of that sort of bunching up that you would get. Um, I've always been a bit reluctant to use elbow pads because I don't like the constriction on my arms. And I've actually found almost a bit of arm pump from some in the past, but these kind of thought, like, slide on in a sort of sock manner, but the way they grip onto your arm feels pretty good. So definitely check out 100% pads if you're looking for some alternative knee pads. Now, a long time ago, I saw a set of Spank Vibro Core bars. Now, Spank makes some very good handlebars, components, bar stems, all that sort of stuff. Now, the Vibro Core, they've got a, like a foam Vibro Core within the handlebar to absorb shock. You think if you grab like a big uh, scaffolding pole and you bash it on something, it's gonna sort of reverberate and it's gonna give you sort of a uh, vibration up your arm. It's gonna feel pretty horrible. You imagine having that full of rubber and doing the same thing, it's gonna absorb a lot of that impact and vibration. That's exactly what these handlebars do. And I can't think why anyone else hasn't done this yet. It seems like such a good idea to me. Now the handlebars, although they're not anything new, they've got this, which is a gravel bar. And all right, I hear you, it's not mountain biking, but a lot of mountain bike brands are offering gravel bikes like that Nuke Proof Digger. And a lot of mountain bikers are using gravel bikes as an alternative means to different stuff for exploration during winter. Having a vibration free bar on one of those sort of bikes where you generally wrap your eyeballs out, it's got to be a good thing, right? Now, a couple of weeks ago on the show, I mentioned the ODI Dreadlock Grip, which is the Tinkawara signature grip. And I got a chance to check these out. Now, at first, when I first saw these grips and heard what Tinker was saying about them, I thought they were just a simple solution for having a better manufactured version of the classic super lightweight foam grip. But it turns out that the foam grips just, they simply don't last as much as the fact they're super light, just like the Vapors. And Tinker wanted a grip that just held up to things a bit better, but offered the supreme comfort and grip. 
Now this is it, it's an aerated rubber on here. It's extremely soft in compound and it's got these dimples for your fingers to sit into. Just a super cool, nice lightweight lock-on grip. And if you don't want the lock-on version, there's also the non-lock-on slide-on grips, which I'm sure the XC riders are gonna love because they weigh next to nothing. Just a nice, cool alternative set of grips. Back to 100% again, just for something on the environmentally friendly basis. Um, a lot of you out there will probably use or have seen people and have friends that use goggles, like motocross style goggles when riding. Now, if you're riding in racing conditions or wet and muddy conditions, you might be familiar with tear-offs, which are a set of clear strips that sit on the goggle lens. And simply put, when they get all covered in mud, you just tear a layer off and you throw it away, essentially. Now, of course, they're designed for use during racing situations where everything is cleared up afterwards. There's no rubbish left behind. However, a lot of riders do use them out in the wild. And what I'm sick and tired of seeing after downhill events and going to downhill locations is seeing tear-off strips laying around the place because they don't decompose. Now, you can get ones that biodegrade, but from what I can make out, they're not quite as clear and the optics on them aren't quite as good yet. And they do take a long time to to biodegrade, so they're not necessarily the best solution. Now there's an alternative method for achieving the same effect. And over the years you've seen various uh, pull-offs and roll-off systems where you have basically a caddy on one side and it's got a roll of film that covers the lens of the goggle and another side with a toggle that you pull it and it pulls a clear sheet across. Now these are a really, really good solution because you're not throwing anything away that the actual film itself can be recycled separately afterwards. Now they might not be quite as cost effective, but for the amount you get in there, I think they're really good. And what I like about this pair in particular is they've got a squeegee system built onto them. So something with all of this, it relies on the tension of the, the film on the lens to be literally on the lens. If there's any sort of moisture or anything that gets behind it, they actually make things worse and you can't see out of them. So this particular one, they've got a 45 mil strip, which as far as I know, is one of the tallest you can get. So your field of vision will be excellent on them. And essentially, the squeegee means when you pull it across, so it strips that film, the old film across to give you some new film, it's not gonna bung up the roll where it's trying to roll onto. So some of the previous models on the market by other brands, they get full of mud and grit and then they clog up and they don't work. And then you're literally left with a goggle that does not work. I just think this is a nice approach and probably a better approach, if not more expensive, to the tear off system out there. Not sure if you remember, but I saw a set of titanium cranks called the E-Wings by Cane Creek when I was at Sea Otter. And they're one of the nicest things I've ever seen for the crank set of a bike. They're just absolutely beautiful. Titanium as a material is lovely. It's notoriously hard to work with in a cost efficient way. But look at these things. Right, so this is the crank on screen, the one that I checked out at Sea Otter. And I was well aware that the axle itself was made of titanium and it had a hearth joint on it, the way they sort of indexed together. The joint itself looked incredible, but I haven't actually been able to see the components individually. Now, when I was at this bike show, I managed to find a little display case, opened it up and I could see all the components individually. I had to take them apart and had have a little look myself. I haven't seen something that's that intricate in terms of titanium axles and cranks for a bike. And I just wanted to share this because I think it's absolutely beautiful, lovely piece of machinery. Next up is Sam Hill's race bike. Um, I spotted this one at the show, still had some dirt on it from when he last rode it. It's just got a few cool things on it that I hadn't seen before. And there's also a few new things in the range for Nuproof that are Sam Hill specific. So his stem looks pretty similar to the rest of the Horizon Nuproof range, but here's one a little bit different. It's got his laser etching on it and it now comes with titanium hardware on it. So if you want a really nice trick stem and it's the ultimate, it just has those little trick features, that's a pretty good option out there. Now Sam Hill's quite famous for using the AVS hand protectors, which to be fair, they're kind of a bit of a Marmite product. And um, you can completely understand why someone like Sam will use them in a racing situation. I think you're gonna see a lot more racers using them in 2019. Now, Nukeproof are now making a Sam Hill edition version of those. They're made by AVS. They've got the Nukeproof graphics on there, clean and tidy. Now, they do look a little strange if you're on the handlebar end, but if you're looking from the spectator end, I think they look amazing. They really, really suit the way that enduro bikes are being ridden. I'd love to know what you think of handguards. Do you think they're a waste of time? Do you think they're disgusting? Do you think they're really cool? Do you think they're interesting, but you don't know if you'd have the guts to run them? Let us know. Love to know in the comments below.
Now also he had a bit of a cool hack I spotted on his bike. Now he's got a mud hugger mud guard on the front of his bike. He's had that for a long time. He uses the smaller one that offers a little bit more mud clearance on there. And on the rear, he had one of the larger front ones cut down, I guess by his mechanic JC to, to fit his bike. And they'd cut a little notch out so it fits around a drivetrain. And I'm guessing this is just to stop mud bunching up in areas of the bike that A, is gonna make it harder to clean, B, it's gonna weigh more when it's on there. Of course, there's not gonna be that much issue with mud clogging up a tire when you're Sam Hill and you ride the way he does. So I think that's just a nice little hack just to make sure nothing bunches up on the back of the bike. And he made it look really moto as well with all his team sponsored graphics all over it. I just kind of think it's cool. Okay, the helmet on screen you can see now is the iXS Trigger. So this is the revamped and the next step up model from the Trail RS. And as you can see by it, it's a double in-mold system which looks far neater. There's no sort of rim between the two layers on the outside shell compared to the earlier editions out there. The peak itself, three position, can move out the way there. Plenty of room for goggles on there and there's loads of air vents. It's a really nice looking helmet. And actually, I think iXS is one of those brands that somehow manages to go under the radar a lot, yet a lot of riders and racers use their products. They make excellent armor and the helmets, I think, look really good. Finally, I just got to check out a pair of those Swole Bay Eddy Current tires. Now, it's an e-bike tire and they look essentially like a motocross tire. 29 on the front, 27 half on the rear, various different sizes. But look at the tread design on them. These things look bonkers. Now, the front tire in the 29 is 2.6 and it's whopping. Look at the size of the tread on that. I reckon that tire would be an amazing all mountain tire, let alone take e-bikes out of the equation. I reckon that just looks like a good, aggressive tire. That's all, I just thought I'd point it out. Now it's time for Bike Cave. You know the drill, this is where we check out where you store your bikes, where you hang your bikes up. Take some pictures of your Bike Cave, tell us all about them and send them into our uploader. The link is in the middle of the screen at the bottom, right there. Super easy to use, just don't forget to tell us what your name is, where you're from and a bit about your Bike Cave. So first up this week is from Eric who's 32 and he's from Czech Republic. After 15 years of my career as a chef, I woke up one morning and changed my job to a bicycle mechanic. Awesome dude. So, oh man, you can see you've got an Oakley glasses case, you've got a full face, we look like a carbon fibre helmet up on the top there. Wilson basketball, selection of trophies there. Very nice, some spy goggles, good little drinks cabinet stashed underneath there too. Looking good. Okay, so, so this is your apartment and you've got, we've got the back, you've got Kona down the back there. I can't quite see the other bike from here. Got some nice Fox Forks and Mavic Enduro wheel set on there. Nice selection of stuff. Oh, it's a ghost. Oh, dude, that's trick as well. Nice looking bike. Got some, it looks like an old bit of carpet underneath to um, preserve your floor from all the grease. Uh, you've got some sort of tray under there. Looking good, dude. Nice work. Wow, now look at this one. So this is Stacy's Yeti Bike Cave. Uh, Stacy in um, Katie, Texas, I guess. It's Texas. Um, finished setting up my garage MTB shop. Dude, it looks amazing. So a giant pegboard on the back there. Looks like you've put this up on a load of battening. You've got rubber flooring underneath there. Big Park Tools workshop logo. I've got one of those at home. I like those. Uh, Santa Cruz and Fox logos. You've got all your gear hanging up on the wall. Oh, mate, it looks awesome. You've got one of those Feedback Sports work stands. They're good quality. Really decent. Some big G clamps down there. Little goggles. I like your drill holder. That's a nice nice little hack. I might, I might rob that idea. Very good. Um, yeah, looking good. You must be quite a tall guy looking at how high you keep all your uh, lubes and stuff up on the top shelf. Or maybe that suggestion might have some little dudes and dudettes running around the place and keeping them out of harm's way. Um, looking good. Really nice. Lovely Yeti. Gotta love a Yeti. Automatically get a super nice and bike vault. Don't know why that is. It's just a Yeti. It's just something about them. Um, nice. Cool. All right. Next up's from Adam. Now, this is a bit of change of scenery. So, Adam's in Czech Republic. Hi Doddy and the GMBN crew. Because I had nothing to do except studying electrical engineering, I restored my bike cave. I'm living in a flat, so space is something I just don't have. The original bench was made by my granddad 10 years ago. Awesome dude, so it's got a bit of history behind it. Uh, and since I've grown up a bit, um, it started to be a bit small. I'm 185 centimeters, so you can imagine how small everything was. I went to a local DIY store, bought some OSB desk, a few prisms, and one weekend later, I've got a new bench with some storage underneath and a lot more working space. Yep, all dude looking good. Um, 
Lighting's homemade, every tool I have is in the box. I try to be organized. So there you go, the new workbench, definitely a much better use of space. And obviously you've got loads of space underneath there, the way you've designed that. Also like the fact you've done a curved edge on it because I did build something like that at a previous property I lived in. And uh, I remember catching my hip on it a number of times. What old pain that was. But yeah, looking good, mate. Yeah, really good. And you've got your PowerPoints up on the wall. Um, nice, you own some Makita kit. Always nice, that is. Um, Wow, awesome, thanks for sending that in. Ah, and we're out of the bike cave for this week. Keep them coming in, folks. So now it's time for Rewind. Yep, this is the retro section of the show. Get anything you have that's retro into us at the link at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, tell us all about it, could be anything. Could be an old race jersey, could be a retro photo of yourself on a bike in whatever area that might be. It could be a whole bike, it could be some components. Literally anything goes. I love talking about this stuff. And even better, if you've got any questions about retro kit, retro riders, maybe modern tech that's evolved from retro stuff, let us know and we'll dig up some history for you and tell you all about it. First up is some history I spotted at that bike show I was at last week. So this on screen is the GT RTS 1, and this is a very fine example of it. Absolutely immaculate condition. Classic Judy SLs in the Judy yellow on the front. Tioga Psycho tires on there. That tire was famously bad, but everyone wanted to run them because John Tomac ran them. Somehow he made them stick in every turn. Um, what they were really known for was the bad transition between the center tread and a massive aggressive shoulder. The shoulder cut an amazing edge when you're on it, but getting to it, you're kind of in like no man's land. So a bit of a tricky tire to run, but very good if you pushed it hard. Um, XTR cantilever brakes on there, classic XTR levers too. There's another shot of that fork, just look at that. It still looks cool now. It's funny because that fork looks so chunky then, but if I showed you it now, it'd be something like that pace next to a modern Fox 34. Literally, it's like almost laughable in scale by compared to what we have today. So as you can see, there's a high pivot there up halfway up the seat tube there and a crazy rocket at the bottom there, driving that shock mounted onto the down tube. Uh, the shock was made by Nolene, a US manufacturer that does motor, motorsport stuff as well. Uh, very cool, just a really beautiful example of the bike. And I can't believe the condition it was in. Uh, considering it's an old retro bike. All right, now it's time for top mods. If you've got any modifications you have done to your bike, take some photos or better still, take a video on your phone or any sort of camera type device that you have and send it in to us. Tell us about yourself, tell us what you love to ride, tell us what you're riding and tell us what you have modified on your bike. What I'm talking about here is literally anything. You could have upgraded the rear derailleur because you bent one in a crash. It could be a change of handlebar grips. It could be a complete frame overhaul. Anything goes, whatever it is, we love to hear that you guys have been tweaking and tinkering with your bikes. So keep them coming in. This week, a little bit different. It's not one from you guys. This is a bike that I spotted that's essentially a one-off and it's a Mondraker Foxy 29, but with a difference. So the UK distributor of Mondraker bikes is a company called Silverfish. Now they've been in business now for 20 years. So all of the staff got together with Mondraker to build this complete custom bike for him with all of the Silverfish graphics. Now look how badass this thing looks. Down, all down the top tube there, you've got the classic zombie logos. They've got this big zombie van that you see driving to the races and there's remnants of it all over the bike. The pint glass on the back of the seat tube there. Man, just, just look how nice this is. The finish is amazing. Now time for tech of the week, and this week, well, I just thought I'd show you my new bike, really. Um, I've been after a lightweight bike for some time. So everyone knows I like a large bike, an extremely large bike. So my main bike is my Nukeproof Mega 290 in a size XL, which is absolutely colossal. Uh, it's got that 515 mil reach. It's a really, really big bike. And as amazing as it is, in winter time, locally to the GMBN office, it's not the most useful bike. Sometimes you need something a bit lighter. Now, I had my eyes on a Canyon Lux, like Neil has, the cross-country race bike. But unfortunately, they haven't had one in stock in my size, so they suggested trying out the Neuron. And now it's here, I actually think this could be the best all-rounder bike for me. Now, this bike's got 29-inch wheels, 130mm travel, front and rear. And it doesn't really sit in a cross-country turf, nor does it sit in that aggressive turf. It's just a mountain bike. So, my aim is to have this set up quite light so it feels more like a cross-country bike to me but just with a little bit more travel a bit more forgiving 
Now this is a size XL, a little bit smaller than the Nook Proof, but bearing in mind what this is for, it's not an aggressive extreme bike. This is just a mountain bike for day-to-day -day riding in off-road situations. It's got a 67 and a half degree head angle up front, 440 mil chainstay out back, uh, which is good. I like a long chainstay. Um, but unusually on it, the reach on it is quite short. So it's 473. Now, most size XL bikes tend to hover around 480 upwards, and obviously I like them towards 500. But what this means is I can fit a 60 mil stem on this, and it gives it a bit more of an XC feel. Um, and as you can see, obviously I've got my Garmin set up on here. This is a bike that I'm actually gonna attempt to get fit. So I can have some fun and do some different things over on GMBN instead of Neil and Blake doing all the cool stuff. I hope to do some good stuff this year myself as well. But this is it as it is. Um, it's got flat pedals on at the moment because the weather's been pretty bad here. I rode it into work for the first time last week on Friday uh, on our first snowy day of 2019. Uh, there's a few pictures just flashing up on screen. I think you'll agree, it looks pretty smart, a nice clean looking bike. Um, since this time, I've now put some different tires on it and I've got different wheels on there. Customized a few little things just to get it the way I like it. Uh, I might do a bike check when I've made a few different alterations to it, but I'm pretty pleased with it. It's nice to have a lightweight bike that's a bit more realistic for most things that I tend to do on bikes. And it does mean then I've got the big gun to wheel out when we go and ride the real rough stuff or the bike parks and stuff like that. So I feel like this is a pretty good balance for me. And there we go, another weekly GMBN tech show in the bag. If you wanted a couple more great videos, click down here if you want to see how to set your bike up to cope with the sort of strains that urban riding does, sort of jumping off curbs, smashing down flights of stairs, that sort of stuff. And click over here for five common questions. And within that, there's also another section of two videos with five common questions, all tech related. Hopefully they're gonna help you out. As always, give us a huge thumbs up if you like GMBN Tech and give us a little click on that subscribe button if you haven't already done so.